glad to be here today. And where is my pastor? He did not tell me he wasn't going to be here. Oh. <laughs> He's grounded for two weeks. Um, does anybody got one?
Well, I don't know. I, I just checked my messages. I haven't heard from him. So. Must be him right there. I see his car pulling All up. All right. Well, then. We'll ground him for two. Exodus chapter 23. Now, I'm not saying perfectly word for word, sentence for sentence in the Old Testament. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but I'm just not a great scholar in it. And, but there's something we get way down to about, um, we'll start the 14th verse today. Now, you've heard Stevie preach on numbers of times, I believe, that the Old Testament contains many types and shadows that's fulfilled in the New Testament. I agree with that. Yeah. Although I can't say I can dot every eye across every T. But now we have here the 14th verse of the 23rd chapter of Exodus. Three feasts each day. Three times thou shalt keep a feast until the end of the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat I live in bread seven days of the command of thee in the time of point in the month of ABIB. And for in that cometh out of the land of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. Now, we begin to look at these. The Feast of Unleavened Bread ties right in with Passover. Now, in 1 Corinthians, it says Jesus is our Passover. Now, in the Old Testament, under their term of Passover, on I believe it's the 12th chapter. I forgot what the chapter is in Genesis. Where Moses is fixing to bring the people out of Egypt, God tells them to put, kill a lamb and put the blood in three places over the doorposts of their house. And that night he was going to pass through in every home that did not have the blood over the door, he was going to slay the firstborn. So they were delivered that night. All the found was safety was under the blood. This is symbolic of our deliverance from sin. Now we'll all you hear many songs about out of Egypt's land, the children of Israel fled. Now we were in bondage to sin. He took the blood of Jesus to break that bondage. Now, many, many people have different viewpoints about getting saved. Some people believe that before you really save, the preacher has to baptize you in water. I don't agree with that. The preacher had nothing to do with me getting saved. Amen. Some people believe other things. Some Pentecostals believe you have to speak in tongues. Well, I believe in speaking in tongues. I don't believe that's what made me a Christian. I was a Christian because of one thing. God saved me. I, the blood was applied. That's where my safety is. Some people believe different issues about this. But today we believe in the safety of the blood. We believe that the Passover was fulfilled in Christ. Now, the unleavened bread to me, while they, they, they were... <coughs> For in that came us out of the land of Egypt, and none shall pay before me empty. But here's a thought that I get from it. Spiritually speaking, what am I to you? That comes through Christ. I'm not supposed to add in. Unfortunately, in the Christian doctrines, there is many doctrines that came from paganism. They have polished them over and put Christian names on them. But they're not Christian. They, they have been adapted from pagan religions. Uh, the Catholic Church was very big in that. And some of those ideals has come across among the Protestant people. But it's our duty to make sure what we believe and what we teach comes from the Word of God. Not the imagination of some man. That being said, it's a little bit more complicated than what people want to admit because you get on their pet doctrine if they can't prove it in the Bible, you've got to watch out. People get offended at you real quick. Now, and we go on a little further here. And the feast of harvest 
the first fruits of thy labor which thou hast sown in the field, and feast of ingathering which is at the end of the year when thou hast gathered in the labors out of the field. Now here we come into a great question. Right down through the middle of the born again people, we have a great split here. The feast of first fruits and its representation. They have, in Daniel, there's a prophecy in the seventh, ninth chapter, beginning with verse 24 70 weeks shall be determined upon thy people from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. He said, 69 weeks unto Messiah the Prince. There is almost complete agreement. 483 years from the beginning of that time, Jesus is going to appear. After that, they throw the agreement out the window. Uh, that leaves one week. Many people believe that week, we've got what they call a gap. That in, from the 69th to the 70th week, we've got the church age. Now it's been about 2,000 years. And during this period of time, God stops the clock for Israel. He starts up the church, and then the church is, uh, goes on. And sometime in the future, the church is ruptured out. Then the 70th week starts up. There are those of us that believe the 70 weeks will progressively pull through one week right after the other. And we all believe that these first fruits were gathered in the 70th week. But now, most of you probably raised a garden, seen a garden. When is the first fruits gathered? Out of the garden, when is the first fruits gathered? When you get, when you begin to raise a bunch of tomatoes, you go out and right. yeah. and you go out and begin to, the first tomatoes you begin to pick. That's the first. The latter fruits are the last fruits you gather in the fall of the year. Now, why is this different? Most of the people, if they understand what they're saying, that believes that the seventieth week is yet to be fulfilled. The seventh week comes after we are taken away with the Lord. So if you're ready, what difference does it make? Don't make none. Well, what if you was ready? If you believe in the, that the seventh week comes after the, the Lord comes back, you believe you've got seven more years to repent. That's where the critical point begins to come in about rapture. You know, we know it's common sense that when the Lord comes and calls for the Christians, all that has their sins on the blood is saved. I don't know of anybody among the born again people disputing that. But here is what comes in next. Those that believe in a rapture, when they really get down to, the, to their doctrine, it is the said first fruits have not yet been gathered in. And that after the rapture, I'm going to use about 144,000 souped up Jewish preachers going to go out. And when in three and a half years, they're going to get more people saved than the church got for 2,000 years. Because they're going to get 144,000 Israelites. Then they're going to get a multitude that nobody can number. They call it the tribulation saints. There are those of us that believe the 70 weeks was fulfilled, believe the first fruits was fulfilled in the ministry of Christ and the apostles immediately following the resurrection. Jesus said when he started his ministry, and here's why I believe this, he starts the apostles, he says, you go out into, you don't go to the Samaritans, you don't go to the Gentiles, you only go to the Israelite people. And then on in Matthew, he tells the woman that uh, comes and says, Lord, help me. He said, what's well, not me to give the children's bread to the dogs? She said, but the Lord, even the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the table. She was a Gentile. Yeah. So the Lord helped her. Now, he never refused to help the Gentiles, but he did not seek out the Gentiles during his ministry. This time was allotted to Israel to accept. 
following the resurrection, on the day of Pentecost, the apostles with a group of other people in Jerusalem waiting on the promise. The Holy Ghost fell on them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak in tongues, and this amazed the whole crowd. The crowd begins to gather in, and Peter begins to preach. 3,000 people got saved that day, and I want that's the point I want to get to. But of that 3,000, there's no indication that even one of them was a Gentile. Oftentimes people say it's 3,000 people, you know, they come from all the nations under heaven, that's true. But the other one was a devout Jew. They gathered there for the rest of that day. In fact, I would say when Peter preaches to Cornelius' household, the Christians with Peter was very astonished that Cornelius' household, them that heard Peter, received the same gift that they did at Pentecost. They were astonished at this. They, I, those of the circumcision, this was Christian Jews. Now what I'm getting here is, this 70th week, I agree with the other folks, the, seventh, the first fruits was gathered in that week. To me, the 144,000 represents the fact God missed nobody among the Israelites that wanted to be saved. A square number was perfect among the Greeks. So when the 12,000 out of 12 tribes gives you a square number. So I believe God perfectly, I believe 144,000 is symbolic. All of the Israelites that would believe Jesus, God saved. Those that would not were broken out of Israel and no longer part of Israel. Now, why is this important? Look, if you go, I went to Pentecostal Church here in Monroe. To, they had a Bible study. And they spent the entire Bible study trying to prove that the rapture was true. I asked Matthew and Tyler a couple questions about the end times. Maybe they considered it, maybe they did not. It took me a long time praying, reading, and studying. But see, here's the thing. I'm not going to tell your child, your nephew, your daughter, your son that sits back here and it's not saved. I'm not going to tell them that after the Lord comes, they've got seven more years to repent. Amen. I ain't going to tell them that because I don't believe that. I believe when the Lord returns, it's over us. So the first fruit share, I believe, was fulfilled among those people that accepted Christ and during Christ's ministries and the apostles' ministries following the crucifixion and resurrection up until Cornelius' household. Now, when, Kirk, when the Lord opened the door to the Gentiles, 10th chapter of Acts, then the gospel begins to go out to all peoples. Then this great multitude that was saved out of all nations, kindreds, and tongues of people also included the people from Israel because they're part of the all nations. To me, these are the people saved all down through the years. If you take the other viewpoint, you go to the fourth chapter of Acts, uh, of Revelations, verse 1, you got the rapture of the church. Everything in Revelations after that has to occur progressively within the next seven years. If you look at all the literal events that happen, they make them literal, the world cannot survive. We had twin towers blowed up and we had great calamity all over the country. But if literally a star falls from heaven and poisons half of the water of the uh, waters of the world that would poison the drink, literally if one third of the green grass grows burns up, you realize the contamination from one third of the world burning up would poison the rest of the air. Many of these things in Revelations are symbolic things that's going to happen spiritually. And, but the Lord gives them in little. Jesus said, I'm the rock. I'm the bread. Many things is given 
in natural terms that have the spiritual meaning. So, if you believe the rapture, the world can't end next week. Because Jesus hasn't come yet. All of Israel hasn't been saved, pertaining to all Jews. And so I asked some of my friends to know how much of the good blood I got to have to be saved. You know, probably us people have come from <coughs> uh, British, Irish, and Scottish people, we probably all have some Israelite blood in us. Because when they carried away the ten tribes captivity, it seems they probably were merged into Western Europe. And Western Europe is in a great extent bloodline descendant. Do I believe that makes a difference you get saved? Absolutely not. What makes a difference you get saved is whether or not you believe the gospel. I don't care who you are. I don't care what color your skin is. You have the same chance. You believe the gospel, God will save you. I used to tease my wife about <coughs> predestination. I'd say, I believe in predestination, honey. She said, I want you to shut up. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I believe it's predestination. Whosoever believes in gospel, God will save. <laughs> well, that's true. It's a predetermined fact. If you believe the gospel, God will save you. It's also a predetermined fact. It ain't negotiable under no circumstances. If you refuse to believe the gospel, God will not save you. That's not a negotiable thing, so it's predestinated. It is, I don't believe God decided whether or not I have to be saved. He decided to save me whether I liked it or not. I don't think it was that. So here the thing is, the first fruits, I believe, are not convinced several Sundays down into a few minutes, but the first fruits, the speech of the first fruits, were representative to me of those Israelites who were saved during the ministry of Christ and immediately following the day of Pentecost, which was fulfilled by the time Cornelius began to come into the church. The importance is what we make of these understandings. We have People don't preach about the end, they preach about the rapture. And it, uh, I forgot who the other two fellows was that wrote those books, and they wrote a whole series of books, probably made several million dollars. They sold, I don't know, hundreds and thousands, millions of them to the people. And they, they have a progression. The Antichrist, the rapture, fighting the Antichrist afterwards, uh, and it's all fantasy. There's four verses in the Old Testament that are really interesting. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, I think it is. These eight verses. What you believe about them will determine what you believe about the end times. So it will pretty well determine. We have, we've got six, eight, ten different ideals of the end. And the major point is this 70th week. Do we have seven years of time after the return of the Lord, which God will go back and rebuild the tabernacle of Israel on top of Mount Zion and save all Israelites. And these Israelites is going to get them all to save that no one can number. Are we looking for such a great revival? Are we looking for things to get worse and worse and worse until the Lord returns? And that's it. I spent a lot of time on, on this one because. If you go to Baptist churches, you go to Pentecostal churches, you go to Nazarene churches, you go to, to the Holiness churches, you go to Presbyterian churches, the Lord's going to rapture out the church and we're going to get out of here. Then all these folks that's left, they're going to pay the penalty. For the next seven years, but they still can get saved. They just got seven years to go through the penalties. 
Now, I, I plainly believe this. Saved or not, any penalties coming, we're going to be here. And when the Lord returns, brother, she's over. If you're ready to go, you can go. If you ain't, your destination's hell. You don't got seven more years to repent of. Amen. This is the great thing. And it all hinges on the fulfillment of this scripture. When were the first fruits to be gathered in? <coughs> Are they yet to be gathered in after we raptured out? Or were they gathered in when Jesus started preaching and the apostle preaching after that leading up to preaching to Cornelius' household? I believe there is no break between the 69th and 70th week. I believe I heard Paul Stanton saying, if I understood him correctly, he did not believe the gap theory. The gap theory is that at the end of the 69th week, God shuts time down. Then sometime in the future, he raptures out the church. Between the 69th and 70th week is this time that it's assigned to the church. I saw a man, well-known, well-liked, you know, preach on the gap theory. Church age. Church <coughs> nice weekends. Time periods will stop. Summer's out here in the future. The Lord raptured out to church. God starts back Israel. Now, these people are going to get saved. They got, we, the church, is the temple of God. So the Bible says. But they teach God's going to build another temple on Mount Zion, and they're going to go back after the rapture, and they're going to start offering back animal sacrifices. Now, then all you have, now the Holy Ghost is gone, and the Spirit of God, the church is gone, so they got a new covenant. And in that new covenant, all is required to say, Lord, save me. On your own mission, your own God. See, under our covenant, you must be drawn. How is it preached? Preacher words it. No conviction, no conversion. But what can what convicts us? The Spirit of God. If it's no longer here, what would there be to convict us? Yeah. Only our own merit. What's that worth? Zilch. Just our mirror. Uh, so, the time comes that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They put this after the rapture. But I got news for you. What Peter was referring to was that the Jews were real stuck that only they were going to get saved. But what Peter said, the time now is that whosoever will believe will be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, whether he be a Gentile, a Greek, if you want to divide it up like that, barbarian, an Israelite. And it is one other thing, and we'll move on with the rest of the lesson. In David's time, it was a great Ezra rose to her greatest stand. Solomon was David's son, king after David. The next, I forgot. I'm not good on remembering all of these things no more. David's son, grandson, great grandson. The nation of Israel split into two nations. Ten tribes to the north retained the name Israel. Two tribes to the south had the name Judea. Jesus was to come through the tribe of Jew. The tribe of Jew was in Judea. Judea become to be a Judean, become to be a Jew. The ten tribes were never referred to in the Bible as Jews. In fact, there's no reason to call the ten except they moved to Judea. Judea become to be a term, Jew become to be a term for those people from Judea. So, was Jesus a Jew? Yes, but he also was an Israelite, but not all Israelites were Jews. But they, today, 
They are teaching that God's going to save everybody that is an Israelite, for God shall save the Jews. See how I, I twisted my words there? Do you realize that if God saves everybody by bloodline, every person descended from those ten tribes where they are in the world will be guaranteed salvation? My grandfather Johnson's people would love that. Because they believe in absolute unconditional predestination, what is to be, will be, what ain't to be, won't be, don't forget. Don't worry about it, it's going to whatever you want to. The Lord take care of it. That's his business. But I think we got some choices along the road. We have to decide if we're going to believe or not believe. Well, we spent quite a bit of time on that, but the harvest of the first fruits. First fruits. To me, you put out a patch of tomatoes and you promised me some of the first fruits. Now, the tomatoes start getting ripe, you know, in July, and you didn't give me no tomatoes. Long about October, you come over with a vast tomato. Here's them first fruits. I'm going to look at it and say, uh, thanks for the tomatoes. <laughs> but the first fruits, that's the first maturity that begins to come on the plant. And this becomes to be important because, brother, when the Lord comes back, I'm afraid if you ain't ready, you done lost it. You come finally come, you know, Steve, you come up here and I'd like you to pray, please pray, please pray, please pray. Come back next week, please pray, please pray, please pray. Please pray. Come back next week, come back next year, please pray. But there's coming a time that you're, you'll hear that last invite. And when the Lord returns, the last invitation has done been given. Amen. We'll go on with repetitiously. Please pray. Please pray. God loves us. It's not God's will that anyone can go to hell, but it's God's will that we all defend. But He does not make us obey His will. Now then, so at the end of the end gathering, there was a feast for that. Each one of these feasts is this. They had to, all the men had to go out to Jerusalem to get in for the, the feast. Three times in a year, all thy males shall appear before the Lord. They were appear before the Lord and for these feasts. But to me, these feasts were fulfilled in the grace plan spiritually. These were physical, natural things. Now, they, each year they had to take a lamb. They had to the slaughter it. The high priest had to go in and he had to take the lamp, blood of the lamb and offer in behind, you know, the into the holiest of holies. Nobody could go in there but the high priest. And he could only go once a year. And he had bells on the end of his robe just in case he done something to God slated to him. The Jews didn't go in there and get him. They had a rope tied to his ankle. And, he, and that veil quit ringing, and they pulled him out. They didn't go in there and get him. You could not go into the presence of God because you were guilty of sin. And God did not accept sin. But when Jesus came, what happens? He predestinated. He predestinated would be conformed to the image of his son. And I was lost. I was just a center boy, Dave, not much different to no other boy in the community. But God saved me. So what happened when I got saved? God forgave me of everything I'd ever done wrong. He perfected <laughs> my past. Made me free from sin. The Spirit of God took me. Now, I didn't reach up on the doorpost and get Jesus as I went into the church house that the Spirit of God took me and baptized me into the body of Christ. And when I was baptized into the body of Christ, I was baptized into the church dead. Only through Jesus could I go into the presence of God the Father. Now they had a temple over there that they, God's presence was in. But now, where does God's presence? It's still in the temple of God, but it dwells in us. Christian people. God's presence is there. 
But how can we come before God in the temple today? Through Christ. Through Christ is how we come before God. Now we can make, we can go right spiritually right into the presence of God and make our requests known through Jesus Christ. Thou shalt not offer the blood of thy sacrifice of leaven bread, neither shalt the fat thereof a sacrifice of made into the morning. Now I didn't really feel this unleavened bread. You know, this was bread without our, I think any herb, any flavor, anything in it. I believe this represents the fact that me and you spiritually should consume spiritually the food that comes through Jesus. He said, if you tell you eat my Christ and drink my blood, you have a life in you. He was not talking about the natural thing, was he? He wasn't talking about us getting a cup of more Lord cup. Uh, the Catholics, when they have the Lord's Supper, they re-sacrifice the Lord over every time they have the Mass, according to them. They re-sacrifice Him thousands of times a day across the world. But how many times was He sacrificed? One. Will He ever be sacrificed again? No. No. It is a symbolic thing in remembrance of His sacrifice that it was done. This is important. Do you know they should kill people because they resisted believing them that sacrifice in it? You know the term Pentecostal? The word Pentecost means the 50th. It's a nickname. Uh, do you know the term Baptist is actually a nickname? You're coming from the fact that they resisted the baptism of infants and says you need to be baptized after conversion. From among those people come the people that become to be known as Baptists. Now, I like what Stevie said the other day. He said, I'm a Christian. I am a Christian. I believe in water baptism after conversion. I think it's a mistake to baptize a baby because you send false signals. You signal to that baby that it, it is a member of the church when it is not. It has not been saved. Therefore, this if it lives long enough to know right from wrong, there will come a day that he'll feel conviction and to go to heaven, he must repent and be saved. How many all are called you think they'll have a cross on the road in the churches that believes in baptizing babies? Stevie, how much time does Stevie spend up here begging people to pray? If we begin to baptize our babies into the church, he could stop that. They'd already be members of the church. But they wouldn't be Christians. You must repent. There's no conversion without conviction. I like to really people to understand that. When you feel the conviction, it's such a precious thing. If the Lord should elect not to convict you no more, you know, you'll never pray for your saved. You could live 40 years, but when you don't feel conviction, you'll never be saved after that. Amen. Uh, and do you ever think about where the... the Jesus met the man that had the legion of the devils in him. And what the devil said to Jesus, why have you come to torment us before our time? We know who you are. So in other words, why didn't they repent? James said they believed with fear and trembling. They didn't they recognize Jesus. Don't bother us now. It's not our time to be punished. But you see, what happened is they have been reserved in everlasting chains of darkness. Repentance is no longer open to them. They are, they are in a state of darkness. Which time do you see in the Bible where they meet a man that's possessed with the devil? That devil cries out, please forgive me. 
can no longer, he has no mind of repentance. He knows punishment's there. Why have you come to torment us before time? Go away and leave us alone. You know how dangerous it is for a sinner to sit back there and feel conviction and say, no, Lord, leave me alone. I've got some things I've got to take care of. My will is more important, more important to me than yours is. Just leave me alone now. What if he does? That's the worst thing that ever happened to you. God decided to just leave you alone. Yeah. Let you go. Let you do what you want to do. I hope I'm not bored you today is a little bit of a departure from the rain lessons because I hope you're not bored you to this. But listen, today is the day of salvation, not after the rapture. Today is the day for you to please God. You won't have time to please him after the rapture. Today. Then, I cannot believe that the first fruits, church has been running now, grace plan for 2,000 years, but they go together, the first fruits, right at the end of time. To me, first fruits have never got the beginning of the church. Right at the time when Jesus said, I've come only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now the Gentile was saved under the Pentecost, as far as the Bible recorded. Now the Gentile was saved from Pentecost to Cornelius, as far as there's any recording in the Bible. In fact, when the Gentiles received the Holy Ghost as they did at Pentecost, the Christians went Peter that were Jews were astonished because the Gentiles were given the same thing they were. So, you hear people say, the Lord, the end can come tomorrow. Those who believe the rapture do not believe that. It's impossible for the end to come tomorrow. The end has to be over seven years away. Now they'll say, the Lord can come tomorrow. But they don't believe the end of the world will come until seven years after that. After the church is raptured out. After the church is raptured out, they're going to build a temple over in Jerusalem. A stone temple. They're going to go back from the spiritual temple to a physical temple. Then they go into, without the benefit of the Spirit of God, they're going to convert hundreds of millions of people in three and a half years. A number that would be supposedly greater than the church got. The implication is there that it's the number greater than the church got for 2,000 years. Right now is the time to make advantage of what God has offered us. Next week might be too late. <coughs> Today. Thank God, he said, well, there's two or three together to get in my name. I'll be one there in the midst. Yes. There'll be two or three here, two or three down there, but they will be great. But thank for the glory of it. From the days of the apostles until the return of the Lord, there'll be a number of people saved that no man can number. Come out of all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. Satan says, ain't nobody that's going to be saved. Ain't 15 of you, ain't 12 of you, ain't 5 of you. No, there'll be a number of no one can know. Everybody that wants true 